I want you to take your Bibles and stand, if you're able, to uh, Jeremiah chapter 33. I noticed on the outline, it said, the message, it said Dr. Benny Tate. Just kidding. It's just me. He's not in the bathroom, going to come out later. It's just me. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 1, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time, while he was still shut up in the court of the prison. Thus says the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Call to me, and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Jesus, that's what we do today in this hour. We call unto you. We ask you to reveal to us great and mighty things from your word that we do not know. Help us, God. Help us. Be with us. Speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I want to talk to you today about the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Prayer is powerful. It's powerful. I heard the story about an atheist bar owner who built a bar in a dry town. Obviously, the people of the town were not too excited about it. And the church down the street from the bar decided they were going to do something. They were going to start a 24-hour prayer vigil to begin to just pray and call out to God and ask God to intervene on their behalf. Sure as the world, a night came where a storm blew through, lightning flashed and hit the building and burned it to the ground. The bar owner was furious. He couldn't believe what the church had done. And so he went and he filed a lawsuit accusing the church of burning his building to the ground. The church now in the middle of the lawsuit decided, oh, we've got to hire an attorney. And their chief argument was, we had nothing to do with your building burning down. Now the court case came before the judge. The judge was sitting there and he was looking it over. He was before both of them. He said, honestly, I'm a, little bit, I'm a little bit confused. I really don't know which way to rule on this. And I've never felt like this. But he said, I've got an atheist bar owner who believes in the power of prayer in a church that doesn't. <laughs> See, prayer works. Prayer works and there's power in prayer. I heard another story about a preacher who had a female parrot. Only problem with that parrot is she cussed all the time. He'd have guests over from the church and she'd just cuss them out. And it was terrible. He was so upset about it, but he loved the bird. He hated to get rid of it. So he went down to the Catholic priest. He said, Father, I, I don't know what's going on. I've got this female parrot. She's cussing all the time. I don't know what to do. He said, I do. I know what to do. I've got two male parrots. And all those two male prayer, parrots do is just pray. He said, I've got one male parrot to hold the rosary beads and rock back and forth. He said, my other parrot, he'll just keep saying, our father, our father, our father, our father. <laughs> he said, those two parrots are the most godly parrots I know. And those parrots will be a good influence if you'll bring your female parrot around them. So the preacher said, that's a great idea. So he brought his female parrot over one day. They put it in the cage with the other two male parrots. One male parrot looked at the other one and said, you can stop all that praying. We got what we've been asking for. <laughs> that female parrot went right back to cussing. <laughs> See, there's power in prayer. Warren Wiersbe said this. He said that prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. Prayer is laying hold of his willingness. God wants to answer your prayers. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 7, verse 7. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. He said it again in John chapter 14, verse 14. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And again, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, he said this. He said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? 
God answers our prayers. He's not a genie in a bottle. But God wants to answer your prayers. And there's, listen, there's some things that if we're going to experience the power of prayer in our life, if we're going to defy the odds through prayer in our life, that we're going to have to have. And the very first thing that, that I want you to see is that we must need him. We must need him. Jeremiah, in verse 1 of chapter 33, it said this. It said that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Where? While he was shut up or locked up in prison. That's not a great place to be. I mean, it wasn't prison of today. I mean, he didn't have cable. Wasn't like it was, you know, an opportunity to play some games. I mean, he was in a, in a place of true desperation. Because see, what had happened to Jeremiah, and really as you read the entire book, you see that Jeremiah was a prophet that was speaking against his country, warning them, telling them that your blatant disobedience and your evil wickedness is going to cost you everything. And he had come against them and he had said, listen, Babylon, Babylon is going to overtake this entire kingdom. And we're going to be destroyed with famine and with plagues and with disease. That wasn't a popular message. As a matter of fact, so much so that King Zedekiah threw him in prison. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it anymore. And all that Jeremiah was guilty of was just obeying God. And just following what he was telling him to say. And see, sometimes God will take you and allow me to be in a place of desperation in order to bring us to the point of dependence so that we might experience his deliverance. But see, a lot of that always goes back to that place of desperation where you truly realize that you need Jesus. See, Corey Ten Boone, she said it this way. She said, you may never know that God is all you need until he is all you have. See, we've got to realize how bad, how desperately we need him. Abraham Lincoln said it this way. He said, many times I've been driven to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. See, whether you realize it or not, you need Jesus. You need him. I don't know if you realize it, but the Bible says apart from you, apart from him, we can do nothing. You may be thinking all I need is just some money. All I need is just this. If God would just do this, if this could happen, if this could line up, if this would work out, that's really all I need. No, sir, you're wrong. All you need is Jesus. You need Jesus. See, he's our greatest need. But not only that, not only do we have to need him, but we've got to call on him. We've got to call on him. The Lord said to Jeremiah in that prison in verse 3, he said these words. He said, call to me. What is he going to do? I'm going to answer you. See, that place of desperation, it leads us to, to where we realize, hey, I need to call on Jesus. I've got to cry out to God. It's not enough just to need him. We've got to call on him. Charles Spurgeon said, groanings which cannot be uttered are often prayers which cannot be refused. When's the last time you groaned before the Lord a prayer? When's the last time that you poured your heart out? Not for just one prayer in one minute, in one moment of your life, but again and again and again. And you went back to God over and over and over and you said, God, I will not let you go unless you bless me. God, I will not let you go. I'll continue. I'll press on. I'll continue to cry out to you. I'll continue to call out to you. Psalms 116 verse 2 says, Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. That, that, that word inclined his ear, it means to bend down or to tilt over. 
Now I know, we understand that, that in heaven there's a lot of praise and, and there's angels that are around the throne and they're singing, singing holy, holy, holy. We know that according to Revelation. But what this tells me is in the midst of all the commotion of heaven, all the holies and holy and holy, God hears his people praying and he says, hold, hold, hold on just a second. I think, that, I think that's my child. I, I think they're in a place where they need me. I'm going to just lean over and just hear what they're saying. I want to hear what they're saying because I'm going to answer them. I'm going to show them great and mighty things that they do not know. In the midst of all of heaven, God hears you. When we call on him, not only that, we've got to listen to him. We can't just call on him. We've got to listen. Because see, prayer is not just a monologue. I know that, that a lot for a lot of us, a lot of times, it is a monologue. It's just a one-way street. It's just us just yeah, 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 to God. I mean, we just, we just load God's wagon while we got him. We're like, if you're listening, I'm just going to load you up. You have not because you asked not, and I'm about to ask. <laughs> so we just start talking and talking and blabbing and talking and talking. But you know what? Prayer's really a dialogue. And if you'll stop for a minute and listen... In those moments of prayer, you know, God will speak back to you. You know, God will speak to your heart. You say, well, is it something I'm going to hear? Like, no, it'll be louder than that. It'll be down deep inside of you. Unmistakable. God will speak to you. See, in chapter 32, Jeremiah says this. He said, at the time, the Lord sent me a message, and he said, your cousin, Hanamel, Malsamon of Shalom, will come and say to you, buy my field at Anathoth. By law, you have the right to buy it before it is offered to anyone else. And in verse 8, then just as the Lord said, just as the Lord had said he would, my cousin, Hanamel, came to me and visited me in prison and said, please buy my field in the land of Benjamin. I'm going to skip the words that are hard. <laughs> it's hard enough for me to read English, much less whatever that is. Whew. By law, you have the right to buy it before it is offered to anyone else, so buy it for yourself. Then I knew the message I had heard was from the Lord. So, so let's, let's understand the, the dynamic that's happening here. So Jeremiah is in prison. He, he's in prison. His cousin comes to him in prison. The Babylonians have already laid their siege uh, towers on the side of the walls of Judah. They're, they're pressing in on all sides. They, he's already been telling the king and all of the kingdom that you're about to be conquered and taken into slavery and or killed. And this is about to get bad before it ever gets any better. And things are bad. And his cousin says, hey, man, I got a field out there. You want it? I mean, he's in prison. You know, I, at that point, and, and he, he realizes that, you know, God told me you was going to do that. God told me you were coming. In the very moment when I would have thought God had slipped off his rocker, he realizes this is what the Lord wants. He heard the voice of the Lord in the, in the place that was most difficult to hear it. He listened See, we're taught in school how to read and write. We're, we're taught how to, how to talk by our parents, family, friends. God help us. But you know, we're not taught how to listen. We really aren't taught how to listen. And that's a tragedy because God, a lot of times, he speaks in that gentle whisper, in that still, small voice. Psalms 46 and 10, it said to be still and know that I am God. I think that's why the enemy is pleased when our life is just filled with hurry and with speed and we're moving and we've got to always have something behind the next and behind the next and behind the next and we got to just meet with this guy and that guy and this guy and I got an email and I got to return it in three seconds and I got a text message, I got to respond or they'll be mad. We live life literally just at a rate of speed like it's never been lived before. And I believe our enemy is so pleased in it because we cannot hear God. Dallas Willard said this. He said, we've got to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our life. 
it is an enemy of our faith. We've got to eliminate the hurry, the pace that we all keep. It's not pleasing to God. And we can't hear God when we keep that pace. We can't listen to him. FDR, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was convinced that people weren't hearing him. He didn't realize, he said, you know, maybe it's the, maybe it's the White House or may, maybe it's the fact that I'm the president, but they just, they don't really listen to what I say. They just agree with whatever it is and they just keep going. And so he decided he wanted to test this theory out. Just have a little fun. So one night at one of his dinner banquets, they were having all kinds of guests show up and he decided he was gonna say something completely bogus when they came through the door. So every guest that came through the door, he would greet them and say, I murdered my grandmother this morning. And it was amazing. Just like he thought people would pass by and he would say, I murdered my grandmother this morning. They'd say, marvelous. I murdered my grandmother this morning. Keep up the good work, sir. I murdered my grandmother this morning. We're so proud of you. I murdered my grandmother this morning. God bless you, Mr. President. But there was one right at the end of the line, the Bolivian ambassador that came through. FDR leaned forward and he shook his hand and he said, I murdered my grandmother this morning. The ambassador leaned in and said, Mr. President, I'm sure she had it coming to her. <laughs> See, we've got to listen because God is speaking. But next, we've got to obey him. We've got to obey him. In verse 9 of chapter 32, look at what he did. So what did Jeremiah do? He bought the field. Can you believe it? I mean, he bought the field. And he paid 17 pieces of silver for it. It wasn't like an IOU. It's like real money. He used real money in a time of desperation to obey God even when it didn't make sense. I mean, because they really didn't make sense. I'm in prison. You know what I'm buying? Some keys. <laughs> hey, man, you got keys to this prison? I, 17 pieces of silver? I hook you up. Just get me out of this joint. I mean, what's the field going to do? And he made it official, and he signed it, and he had witnesses, and he put it in pots, and he went and buried it out there. It's like, Why? But he knew he had heard God. He knew God had told him what to do, so he just obeyed him. What would it look like if God's people just obeyed him? What would it look like if God's people who have already heard from him would just obey him? Stop trying to make it all make sense. Stop trying to make it fit between your ears. Stop, stop trying to figure it all out. Stop trying to do it all yourself. God, let me help you out. You're busy. Let me see if I can help. And then we just mess it up. What if we just obeyed him? What would the world look like if God's people just obeyed him? Stop arguing with him. Stop negotiating with the God of all creation. We're going to negotiate. What if we just obeyed him? See, Jeremiah just obeyed him. From prison, with little to nothing, he bought a field because he knew God had told him to. So, wait a minute, God. You told me that if somebody speaks ill of me, that I'm supposed to speak well of them. That doesn't make sense. You told me that if somebody slaps this cheek, that I'm supposed to turn and let them get my good side too. Like, that doesn't make sense. You told them when they curse me, I'm supposed to pray for them? Like, no. <laughs> you said vengeance is mine, but I like vengeance. Feels good. When they say something about me on Facebook, can't I say something back? Wait, wait, wait a minute, God. So you said when I get my paycheck, I'm supposed to take 10% of that and give it away? Get, give that back to you? You ain't here, God. I don't know how to give it to you. So I'm supposed to give it to you. 
And you're going to take my 90% and go farther than my 100%. Now, God, I ain't good with math, but I know that ain't going to work. But see, he just obeyed God even when it didn't make sense. Even when it didn't make sense, he just obeyed God. But not only did he obey him, he praised him. We've got to praise him. In Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17, he began to praise him for who he is. Look, look, look what he said right here in verse 17. Oh, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You know what? Regardless of your circumstances, you can praise God for who he is. It doesn't matter if you're going through a difficult time, a good time, a happy day, a sad day. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you can trust that. And you can just praise him for who he is. You say, well, things aren't going well. Well, guess what? God's still God. You could just praise him for being God. You don't have to wait till everything works out in your favor or the way you think it should go. I'll praise him when it works out. No, you can praise him now. You praise him for who he is. Not only that, you can praise him for what he's done. Look at Jeremiah in verse 21. He said, you brought Israel out of Egypt with mighty signs and wonders and a strong hand and powerful arm and with overwhelming terror. He said, I'm not going to forget what you've already done, God. You've already delivered us. You've already delivered our people. You've already been good to us. And I'm going to do what Psalms 103 says, which is to forget not all of your benefits. How quickly we as God's people forget all of his benefits. All of the blessings in your life, the very fact that you're seated here tonight or today is a blessing. You are blessed. Let's not forget all that God's already done for you. Don't overlook it. But not only that, but what he's going to do. Because God's not done. God's not finished. Look at, look at what, what he told him in verse 21. Or I'm sorry, and <laughs> same thing in verse 27. This is what he said. He said, I will, or 37, I will certainly bring my people back. I will bring them back to this very city and let them live in peace and safety. God said, I, I'm going to bring you back. I know I'm, I, right now it doesn't look good. Right now the Babylonians are outside the temple walls and they're like, Ooh, like here they come and like it's getting crazy. I know it doesn't seem good, but I'm, I'm coming back. I'm going to restore that, these people. You're going to live back in this land with peace and safety. And see, we can just praise him for what he's going to do. In Jeremiah, he said, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Not to harm you, but plans to give you the future that you could only hope for. You see, listen, before, in the Old Testament, we read about how God poured his wrath out on his own people. But when Jesus came, a new covenant was established and he hung on that cross and God the Father poured all of his wrath out on his son. All of the wrath for all of the sins of mankind, all that wrath was satisfied with his son, with the death of his son. And so now all you experience in your life is the love of God. That's all that's left for you as the people of God to experience. It's just the love of God. You say, yeah, well, it don't feel like love. It's discipline. But discipline still comes out of a heart of love. Correction, rebuke still comes from a heart of love from the Father. You say, how do you know that? Well, if you've got children, you should know. Amen. If you're not disciplining them, your kids are the one we're all talking about. They're out of control. You discipline because you love. You correct because you love. You rebuke because you love. And all of that from God is just out of his immense love for you. There's no more wrath left. It's just love. And we can praise him because we know that he loves us and he's got great plans in store for us. And we can praise him for those things. But not only that, we can trust him. We can trust him. See, it seemed strange. It, it had to seem strange. I wish the Bible would give us more like ancillary details and little things like 
when he said buy a field, Jeremiah said, do what? Like, I would like like one of those lines in there. Because that would be me. I'd be like, huh? Like, bro, we family, but if I could get through this fence, I'd be on you. Like, you came up in here. I need out. You trying to swindle my money out of me by selling me some patch of dirt out there that I don't care about. Like, I mean, that's where I would be. But Jeremiah just trusted God. He knew he had heard him. He obeyed him. And he just trusted it. Somehow, some way, this is going to work out for my good. You see, sometimes for our life, it's a lot the same. Sometimes for our life, the, the word from the Lord or the report, the doctor's report, it doesn't look good. This can't be from God. The prognosis, the outlook in your life, it doesn't look good. This can't be from God. Because God's always good, and this isn't good. Sometimes God's best, it looks like backwards. Feels like backwards. Sometimes it hurts. But God is working all things for our good. You can trust Him. I'm here to tell you He's the only one who's telling that who's saying, I'm working all things for your good. Your mama, she loves you. Boy, she loves you. You're precious. Or if you are the mama, you love your babies. But she can't give you all things. She can't work everything out for your good, but God can. And you can trust Him. You may not be able to trust a whole lot of other people, but you can trust God. You can trust Him. And you can know He's working it all out. And he's going to take care of you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. The Bible says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. We have such a hard time right there. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. God wants to be a part of our life. If we're going to defy the odds, we've got to be able to access the power of prayer. We've got to tap into it. But we'll never tap into it if we don't trust Him and obey Him. We'll never experience it. Because God's not going to make sense in our minds. I'm telling you, His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So if you think you're going to take God, the Creator God, and fit Him down in your tiny skull, think again. It's not going to happen. You'll never be able to figure it all out. You just got to trust. You just got to say, God, I trust you. E even, even if I'm thrown into prison, I trust you. Even if you tell me to take my money and buy a field right before we're overran with Babylonians, I trust you. Even for the next 70 years of Isolation. I trust you. I'm going to trust you, God. Even if you slay me, I'm still going to follow. No matter what happens, I still, I'm going to trust you. As for me and my house, we're going to follow and serve the Lord. I trust you, God. I'm with Him. I don't know where you are today, but I'm with Him. I encourage you, if you're going to defy the odds in your life, you're going to have to experience the power of prayer, and you can't do that. If you don't line these things up, there may be some of you here that have never really called on Him. Maybe you've never even realized how much you need Him, but you hadn't called on Him. Maybe you hadn't listened. You've just done a whole lot of jabbering, but you've not listened. Maybe you've heard Him and you've not obeyed Him because you think what he said is crazy. Maybe you're not praising him. You're not lifting him up for who he is, for what he's done, and for what he's going to do. Maybe 
you're having a hard time trusting him. Wherever you are, God wants to use your life to defy the odds through the power of prayer. He's got great things in store for you.